The opinions expressed on the following audio program are solely those of the host and the guests. Burner Podcast is an independently produced, not-for-profit show and is not associated with the Burning Man organization or its subsidiaries. The views expressed are not representative of the entire Burning Man community and are presented here for entertainment purposes only. In short, calm the fuck down. It's just a podcast. All right, uh, it's episode number 88. And it is 344 days till the man burns as of this recording. Another turn around the sun. Uh, for those of us who never really had a healthy Christmas break annual life reset, um, Burning Man is basically that for us. That's why I say another turn around the sun. Um, I mean, I, I grew up with Persian New Year, which is fun and all, but I really envied all the other American kids who had like a week of family gatherings and trips back home and presents. And uh, I even envied your family drama, (laughs) to be honest. Um, So for me, uh, five or six years into the community now, uh, Burning Man's really become, as Larry would describe it, uh, that big barbecue, uh, that big family barbecue that I'd always yearned for. And uh, outside of Burner Podcast, uh, I've been working on what might be described as a startup. Uh, I don't know. I spoke with uh, our listener, Matt Meanders, uh, who said it's more like a small business, probably, because I'm not really a tech thing. But uh, I'm almost starting to get comfortable with calling it something like that. I'm not sure. We'll see. But uh, I'd love to tell you about it once it is launched, hopefully in the near future. Uh, Anyway, uh, and... We were laying out uh, some annual structures during a business plan meeting recently, and I had the extremely amusing experience of watching all the burners on the team passionately echo me when I let our finance guy know that we may need to just go ahead and declare burn month our company holiday because he just shouldn't even try to schedule things around late August and early September. And... I I know there are more and more companies, especially in the Bay Area, that just shut down around the burn, you know, and uh, Christmas probably kind of started the same way, right? People were already used to celebrating the winter solstice, I I think that's when it falls. Uh, So this new annual thing just sat really easily right on top of it. I could be wrong. I'm not. Is it, the, is it something? There's something that was already there. There was a pagan holiday that was already there, and Christmas just sat right on top of it very comfortably. Uh, Burning Man co-founder Jerry James, the builder of the very first man, told me during our interview on episode number 82 of this show that they chose Labor Day weekend uh, specifically because, pause for dramatic anticipation, everyone was already off work. It was Labor Day weekend, and everybody was already off work, and that's why they started doing it on Labor Day. That's all it was, really. Coincidental convenience. Today's behavior becomes tomorrow's culture. Indian mystic uh, Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev. <laughs> Vasudev, like the, he's mostly just known as Sadhguru. That's that's when you uh, Google him. That's mostly what they say, call him. Um, he said that uh, in one of his talks that I was listening to recently. Today's behavior becomes tomorrow's culture. And he said that uh, as he was railing against the dangers of elevating um, the, the sacredness of things simply because they happened a thousand years ago. And uh, that really gave me pause. Um, it, it made me reflect that Burning Man... Um, this experience through this culture has made me resolve not to wait a thousand years before seeing the sacred in all things. That it can be sacred right now, while at the exact same time still remain playful and joyful and fun and not that big a deal. Um, Events and people and experiences in life can be everything and nothing at the exact same time. There's a section in today's conversation where I think we get into the core of exactly this topic when Halcyon and I uh, get into chatting about the amazing temple this year. Uh, Oh shit, spoiler alert, today's guest is Halcyon. (laughs) Um, This is the third year he's been our guest right after the burn, so I guess now we can officially call it our annual tradition for the show. And 
The funny thing is, we spend a bunch of time not even talking about Burning Man. I mean, we try. It's me and Halcyon, so I mean, like, we can't talk about any fucking thing else. But you'll hear during the chat about what Halcyon does most of the burn and the story of why I, I had to leave early due to an ice pick headache that just kept getting worse. Um, I had the very traumatic experience of being ripped out of the playa in a manner that made me truly appreciate the Exodus experience. And as much as we like to bitch about it, I've come to the conclusion after this year that Exodus is actually an integral part, inter, inter, I can never pronounce that word, <laughs> inter, integral part of a burn because jamming everything into your car and racing out of there fucking sucks and has left me struggling to realign my energy for the past couple of weeks. So we'll get into that um, in, in just a minute. Uh, Halcyon and I will talk about some of the art this year. We, we do talk about Larry a bit, of course. Uh, I share my Larry story that I forgot to share on our Larry episode, our Larry dedication tribute episode. Um, as this was history's first Burning Man without Larry Harvey. Mark this year, folks. You'll be telling stories about it to your grandkids. Uh, you know, if you're going to have any, uh, we take a couple of detours where we get into the topics of depression and mental health challenges we've both faced, um, mainly because it's something that I'm exploring and having an internal conversation about. Uh, and the conversation today is less of a play by play of Burning Man and more like a little audio decompression for the both of us. I think there are like two elephants in the room regarding this year's burn. Uh, that would be the law enforcement dust up where our community was aggressively and deliberately targeted by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the 747 being left on Playa. <laughs> um, the former we address a bit, the latter we don't, we don't much at all, I don't think. Um, we're working on getting a couple of guests on the show who may be in a position to talk more about both of those topics. Ooh, so teaser. Um, so we'll get into uh, Halcyon in just a minute. But first, I want to take a sec to uh, uh, communicate my overwhelming love and gratitude. Our producer, Rebel Dharma, put together an amazing Burner Podcast event Thursday night at Burners Without Borders Camp. And the crew of Camp Walter brought pretty much the whole Walter show for the party, which like fucking amazing. Um, some of our favorite DJs provided the soundtrack from a top Calliope, uh, Kirk, Mary, Andy, Ricky from Camp Walter. Uh, thank you all so much for your love and support. It, it was really uh, an overwhelming experience. Uh, Christopher Breedlove, uh, the lead at Burners Without Borders. Shout out to Rohan and Ben Harai um, and all the rest of the BWB crew that helped make this event happen. God, there's so many. I, I didn't want to make this intro like one of those things where I'm just like listing off 100 names, but there have been so many people that have made this very short burn pretty magical. Uh, Troy Swanson, our guest from episode 68 in his Genie Tribe. Uh, Ron Feldman uh, from the Ebungalow Village. Super Suze, our woman in the Bay Area and host of Into the Fire. Travmo and the rest of the Perky Parts crew for hosting our Alkaline Sessions Happy Hour on Playa, which I didn't get to make it to personally. Uh, after today's chat, do stick around for an amazing set by Chicago-based Black Velveteen, uh, which was recorded. The set that you're going to hear after the conversation today was recorded from the Air Pusher Art Car from this year's at, the, at this year's Burning Man, and it is just fucking perfect. I'm really excited about sharing it with you uh, after we're ta we're done talking to <laughs> to Pink Jesus. Uh, and shout out to uh, our boy Lewis from out in Bermuda for making that connection with Black Velveteen happen. Uh, today's episode is the post Burning Man 2018 chat with Halcyon. I go by Mr. Arashi. Nobody calls me Mr. Welcome to Burner Podcast. On the first part of the journey, I was looking at all the lights. There were plants and birds and rocks and things. There was sand and hills and rain. The first thing I met was the fire of the bones and the sky.
Yo, yo, yo. Bring the volume. Bring the noise. Bring. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> um, God, we were just talking about like a, a, a bunch of fun stuff. I really like this. I, there's always, it's always the most comfortable recording with you, John. Well, <laughs> I, I, the masseuse is going to be here momentarily. I really want you to feel at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I definitely feel at home. Um, <laughs> Oh, we're a l- lowercase home, not yeah. capital H, as in BRC home. I know. <laughs> when did you get back to town? I I stayed in Reno for three nights, and then I got back uh, the Friday after the burn. Okay, so almost a week after the burn. Okay, and uh, yeah, the I've now I now include two hard nights in Reno as part of my burn activities. Like I usually okay. go light on burn night. I go light mm-hmm. and I go light on sleep, tons of sleep on that night and tons of sleep on, on temple night right? with the intention of like then having a second wind and just partying with all the burners that I missed on playa in Reno at the yeah. grand Sierra. I've been wanting to do that like <gasps> forever. <sighs> It's some people hate it because it's yeah. like you're in a casino and it's like ding, 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 ding. Yeah. And it's like glossy lights and there's, you know, table service at the cabanas and things like that. But I find that it's, it's, it's a true decompression where you are wearing your burner clothes. You're with right. burner people. Beer, people are being zany and loony in the, in the hotel bars, but you are in the default world. And yeah. so you have that kind of one foot in one foot out you still get to play and be who you were on the playa, but you're doing it in a, you know, Hunter S Thompson, crazy yeah. casino, like default world to the extreme kind of uh, scenario. I love it. Right. 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 We, we, um, we stayed at that hotel. Uh, so funny short story right now, real quick. Uh, my, uh, my partner and I were heading over to uh, the, uh, Black Rock High Rock meetup, which was uh, a few months before the burn. Okay. Um, and it was a conservationist a, a environmental event in Black Rock Desert held by the Friends of Black Rock High Rock. Cool. Uh, on the way there, there's all kinds of news happening about like stormy weather and insanity and just rain coming into the playa and like the camp out was supposed to be just looking like it was going to get canceled. So after like our long journey from Southern California to get out there, um, we end up spending the night at the Grand Sierra Resort. Resort, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we got like a. Uh, they have like an app called Hotels Tonight. Okay. Are you familiar with that? No. Where yeah, it's it. The prices like keep dropping because you're if you're going to be like checking in super late, they give you like their absolute last price. Uh, so uh, we get, um, I think I don't know, it was like forty, like forty bucks or something. Nice. to stay there for the night because it was like you know, it was like off season well that doesn't work on uh, coming back from the burn because no. you've got the holiday weekend and then you've got like lines of burners checking in so that's like i i usually make up my reservation yeah you know in the next month or two just knowing that you know i can always cancel yeah. it and rebook it if the rates go down but um i just know that that's where i want to be did the rate i mean i doubt the rates ever go down no the first they did they're really smart they're, they i can't remember it was maybe like six seven years ago maybe longer my brain right. is fuzzy but they 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 courted burners really hard and they had a big prom, like event there and djs by the pool and and they really um and they were very welcoming. Like when right. you get there, they've got people out front with high pressure air hoses to brush off all your <laughs> gear. And they used <laughs> to have awesome. all through the lobby, they had like yeah. the 10 principles of the GSR. And they, they, wow. and they were like, they were really, um, and they've got, you know, uh, trash bins in the, in the, uh, parking lot. And they, they, they just really make it easy for burners. And, like, and wait, wait, like, like paid trash bins? No, like free. The, Huge dumpsters that they just, really? free. yeah. And then they've got, they got tractors that go and then smash it down. Or if you can't lift your things are yeah. too heavy, they've got tractors that will lift things into the dumpsters for you. So just, just to clarify. So like for a lot of people, especially like this is something that a lot of us do in like our first couple of burns when we don't have a trash plan yet after mm-hmm. our exodus, uh, there's a couple of stops in some of those towns right outside, like, I don't know, like an hour outside. Yeah, like Nixon Black and those yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, and Nixon this year, everybody's <laughs> yeah, trying to I'm avoid. I'm not giving them a treasure, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, but yeah, no. So, so you're saying that uh, so at, at Grand Sierra, they actually had trash service as a part of their welcome package exactly. for checking in. Exactly, you could dump all your trash from the playa. Yeah. Wow, that is fucking genius. Yeah, they they really is the inside completely covered in dust. 
uh, they, I mean, they try cause they try to brush you off with the, yeah. the, the air hose, uh, but, but it's, it's pretty thrashed. And, and it, luckily I think they've learned over the years, like the first year, people made a big thing about having parties in the elevators. And so people would take all the, the, the uh, like chairs and furniture that was in the lobbies yeah. and bring them into the elevators. And so I've noticed that in the last few years, there's much fewer pieces of, of furniture in the Wait, lobbies. Who would do that? The burners just to be, just to be take over the hotel. Okay. And just, it, 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 you just keep in that crazy burner mentality of interactivity. And, and it, it's, so, I mean, some people cross the line, I think, but yeah. I think for the most part, the, um, there was a really symbiotic ex- thing where they, they, they want us there. They make right. us feel welcome. They, um, and they, they kind of allow the lunacy. Yeah. And for, for, you know, one and a half, two days, it's almost all burners that are in the hotel. And so there's not that feeling of like, Oh gosh, we got to calm these people down. Right. It's more just like, don't break any glass, you know, keep spending money. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that's yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. You said it's oh, like the, I was going to say that, that, yeah. that, that initially they had like these like $30 rates to get the yeah. burners all in to try it. And since then it's like the most expensive place to stay. Yeah. But, um, but I, I, last year I tried another place thinking that, okay, well maybe people, the burners are going to follow around where the promoters are yeah. throwing events. But to me, the GSR is, is the, uh, it is where the, like the, the burn vibe that I am seeking post burn is there yeah. so heavy. I just like make laps around the casino to the casino bars. And yeah, then yeah. there's like a bowling alley. I just like walk in circles. Like I'm walking around the Esplanade, just like meeting people, meeting people, <laughs> meeting people, <laughs> taking all my extra gifts that I haven't given away and yeah. handing things away. And yeah, it's a blast. That's so funny. Yeah. We, we, we ended up staying there because it came up, like I was saying on that hotel tonight app mm. and like, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, 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 I had it in my head that it was, it's like a hotel casino in Reno. I'm like, um, is this really going to be my kind of vibe? And it is, it is a gorgeous hotel. Yeah. It is like, the rooms that, are great. It is absolutely a resort. Yeah. By the way, we paid 40 bucks and like the room we were staying in was like a condo. It's, it's it was massive. It's plush. And the tea, and they've redone the pool, which is super gorgeous. Although it's funny last year, the, the big pool day, they had a, crazy windstorm. Mm. And so it, it was the first year of this new pool design and they had these big, you know, umbrella things that were all, of, and they started going flying and it was kind of wild to see burners, like <laughs> burners, like cheering and go, yeah, Woo! Yeah. And, and the hotel staff and all of a sudden they're like, we're evacuating. <laughs> they, they, they finally hit the line. We're like, this is dangerous. We've got things flying through the air. This is our first test of this new system and right. it is not going well. <laughs> That's pretty but burners cool. were like yeah. smiling and laughing. Yeah, they, yeah. Were, they were not having it. They weren't like scolding the, the staff. I'm like, Hey, you got to tie it down with this many zip ties. <laughs> yeah. We're like, I can go out to my RV and get yeah, you yeah. some <laughs> tie downs. You got some ratchet straps. I can show you how to do this. But just imagining like after two days, there's all these like zip ties everywhere. Like things being tied down. They're like <laughs> giving out an announcement. Like, can you guys please stop tying down our stuff. <laughs> we know what we're doing. We run a hotel. <laughs> it's funny though. So after like that, that, that trip of mine that I was describing earlier, um, the next morning I ended up having to come back, like fly back to San Diego. Mm. Um, cause I got a, a call that my, my nephew had fallen, um, mm. from like the second story. Um, and he's, he's doing much, 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 much. Okay. He's fine. Yeah, he's fine now. But, uh, uh, it was, it was pretty traumatic. Like it was like this, you know, this journey to get up there and we went through all this, like with, it was personally difficult too. We had some emotional things to deal with on our drive up and then we get up there and the next morning I have to fly back to San Diego. Ouch. It was nuts. So you didn't experience the Black Rock Desert at all? No. And then I, th- to be honest, I, I, I know that they had to make arrangements because there was some in like just massive storm coming mm-hmm. in. Um, and you know, it's not like all of black rock city. It was like this, like small camp out of environmentalists right. and contra- conservationists. So it was, um, it just wasn't, I think they ended up having to move it and I don't, I don't know exactly what ended up happening to it because I was back in San Diego. What, what was the date that the close thing. to it? Cause I was, a, I went to a, uh, a fly ranch little mini retreat yeah. a few months ago. Um, we just missed a bunch of weather, but it was, uh, there's something really awesome about being yeah. in that area when there's not a huge crowd. Oh yeah. 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 No, I was, I was really looking forward to it. Uh, when, when, when was, when you went? Oh gosh. Um, I think it was, it was two months ago. About? Two months ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this was, must've been in April or May. Okay. Yeah. So it must've been like after, after the, the 
the weather experiences yeah. that you're referencing. Yeah. Um, but you know, since, you know, this, this time around, you know, let's get into this year's burn. Let's do it. <laughs> um, the, the, the reason that that story is kind of interesting is that uh, I'll, I'll tell you the short version and then we'll get into the, the development as we tell our stories okay. for the burn. But like a uh, long story short, I ended up having to leave the burn early this year. Oh yeah. Um, we starting like on Tuesday morning, like everything was great. I ran into you Monday night, uh, when Aphrodite was playing at, um, opiate temple. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, you were there for a little bit. And then like the next morning when I woke up, I had this like ice pick headache. Oh no. That was like in my right ear. And, um, by the next day it had moved up to the, like the top of my head. And, um, I was just like looking for whatever solution I could try to find oh, on no. Playa. Like just medication was not working. Um, I went to Rampart, uh, I think like three times. How many people told you you're dehydrated? I was so ready to just like <laughs> punch the next person that was saying, are you drinking enough water? I'm like, yes, God damn it. Yes. I'm drinking enough water. Or, I mean, you know what? Probably not enough. I'm certain dehydration contributed to what I was experiencing because it does to everything. Right. Um, but yeah, but whatever it was like the next, I was literally just like screaming in pain. Like I was, oh, I was, I was, in, I was in horrible, horrible pain. Um, so yeah, Thursday night I was just kind of like trekking through because we had our um our big burner podcast party uh at Burners Without Borders. Oh, right. And I just needed to like get through that event. And then like the next day I was like, I'm not gonna be a fucking victim. I'm gonna find a solution. There's going to be a solution somewhere on on this playa. Uh and I spent the whole day going through looking at different options and continuing to scream in pain. And then finally Friday night, um, my partner was like, I'm sick of hearing you scream in pain. We're leaving. Oh, so wow. we went to, yeah, we ended up driving out, stayed the night in Reno. And the next morning we were at UC Davis emergency where I had to get a CAT scan. So I'm you're, relying on you. Well, you're, you're in front of me. So I'm, I'm hoping this story ends with you not falling down yeah. and, and never getting back up. Well, what, what happened? So far, it's not a tumor oh. as far as I know, as far as I know, uh, I have a neurology appointment October 4th. Um, the general consensus seems to be, oh, this was interesting. At Rampart, um, even on my shittiest burn ever, I have a cool burn story. <laughs> uh, at Rampart, uh, the first day that I went, the volunteer that was taking me in um, was this older gentleman named John. And he, he tells me that he used to be a neurologist and now he's an anesthesiologist. And, um, he's asking me all these questions, kind of, he's like checking my head, this and that. He's like, all right, all right, you know, I think this is what it is when you get in there. Like, he's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not the doctor on call here. So it's not my position to make that call. But when you get into Rampart, um, and for listeners who don't know, Rampart is, is the Burning Man hospital. Um, it's, so there's like the medic camps, like there's the medic tents and stuff. And then if they decide what you're dealing with is hospital level, then you go over to like Rampart. Like triage. They yeah. send you into the, yeah. deeper into the, yeah. the beast. Yeah. So, so he was, he was the intake volunteer and he was looking at, um, looking at my head and pressing on the spots and stuff. And he's like, all right, I, you know, I think it might be this thing. It might be this thing. So I get in there, I end up getting like an injection in my arm, like a, basically a very high end, higher end painkiller. Oh, wow. Um, the next day when I come back and I'm like still screaming in pain at this point, I'm crying, like just oh. bawling. Um, it was really horrific experience. And, uh, the volunteer that's taking me in is watching what a wreck I am. And she says like, Hey, you know what? Pretty like the best neurologist in this state is here right now. Like you're lucky that this person is here. Like we're, we're going to call him in right now for a consult and they call him in to come in. And, um, yeah, I, I learned that he actually, um, is a doctor in Walter Reed and wow. was uh one of obama's doctors what? <laughs> so like the, the per and so he comes in and he's like describing he's like uh, and apparently after he'd met me the day before he'd gone back to his camp and got into researching what my nerve thing might be because he just needed to find an answer for his own wow curiosity so he was telling me he's like yeah i was researching your thing last night i think it might be this so he um he ends up writing me like what he, what he thinks might be, but ultimately what happens is that the doctor's there and everybody agreed that like, they don't have the resources to deal with whatever my issue is. And they like, right. we hate to tell you this, but you, you might need to just leave. Whoa. <laughs> and then, so at what point or did the pain ever 
the Go minute away. we left the playa, oh no, it started to subside. The, like I mean, it, like calm down in um, in aggression in in how constant it was. It just kept calming down, and uh, next morning it was a little bit easier. By the time we got to UCSD, it was like I'm, I'm sorry, uh, UC Davis. It, 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 it was giving me stabs like they were pretty violent stabs because like the pain would just go from zero to ten and then back to zero uh-huh. like 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 super fast um so all of like my meditative practices over you know like the past decade didn't fucking matter worth a shit uh-huh. <laughs> like, because it doesn't matter uh, well i mean luckily yeah. it was a pretty blah year so you didn't miss much oh yeah <laughs> this is kind of a boring year not much happened <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can't I can't hold that straight face. No, was it was good. so awesome. That was good. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always a weird thing to talk about the burn because it's like the story of the the blind men, you know, uh, explaining what an elephant is, and depending right, on right, what right. you experience, is a very different experience. I mean, my year was very much about my camp experience with Pink Heart, uh, my experience with the temple, hmm. and. Uh, a few installations that just like rocked my world that I ended up going back to over and over again. Right. There was this one called uh, the Hexatron that was uh, over near the two o'clock side, near the kind of big rainbow. And it was a field of these 20 foot light poles, like 420 of them. Mm. And they, they had LEDs that were programmed so elegantly and they had these little little audio things in them too. So usually there was art cars there. So you would just be boom, boom. But when there was mm-hmm. no art cars, these little things would, as the patterns would change, it would hit this little like, <laughs> and so it would, at one point it would look like you're in a forest and then you're walking through and then it feels like you're underwater and then it feels like you're going down an elevator oh my God. and then it feels, I mean, it wasn't fast. I mean, you'd spend some time in, in each scene and then it would just feel like you're in the middle of this 3d light show. And it was, I felt like it was like I, I was a string of, on a violin and these, the lights were just like changing my mood at their will. Mm. Another really cool thing. And I love this about, you know, specific pieces that, that kind of do this, I don't know, intentionally or not, but the lighting was so beautiful and soothing that you can hang out there and it's a great place to socialize and meet people because yeah. it's like this really gentle light. And so as people walk through it, you end up, Hey, hi, you know, and you know, I love the boom, boom, boom music. And, yeah. but to me, the, the most precious thing about Burning Man is meeting burners. Absolutely. And so any, any, like, like last year's tree of Tanari, like, you know, it's this place to gather and where it's, it's lit and you can see people and it's kind of welcomes the socializing, right. which is, was the motivation of creating pink heart, which is, you know, it was trying to make a place that has places to sit, soothing lighting, not blink, blink, blink. And, quiet enough that you can have conversations right um to me i mean i love it all but when i'm when it, when i'm like what am i gonna do next I, it's almost i want to meet more people yeah i don't meet more people I, I don't know where they are for the rest of the year but there's yeah. seventy thousand people that i want to yeah. meet right now yeah and it's funny it's a lot of it actually um i almost want to say there uh, a lot of burning man is about for me, like the, the experience, I've had the same experience, but like, I almost feel like the boom, boom, boom music, for example, it's about tiring me out <laughs> so that I have to focus and it's <laughs> right, 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 right. to go hang out at a quiet like bar and playing catch in the park with the dogs. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All of it is just about tiring me out. Like the first half of the week, I'm just like, you know, partying extra hard and, you know, running around. And then like, as the week goes on, I get more and more like settled down into yeah. those experiences that you're describing. Tell me about uh, some of the other art pieces that were hitting you. Uh, oh gosh. You're um, basically my report from the field. <laughs> uh, it, it was an interesting thing because I went back to Hexatron mm. probably five times where every time I would meet a new like special friend, I'm like, yeah. Hey, I want to show you this thing. Mm. And, it, and, and as I was going there, I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to miss there's, I'm sure there's art I'm going to miss because I'm doing this, but it just like, I just fell in love with it. Um, do you do that? Do you do that every year where you find a piece of art that you like and you go back to it multiple times? No, that, that, that okay. normally I'm just like, Hey, let's, let's, I feel like I, I spend so little time out on playa. I spend yeah. so much time yeah. in camp hosting that if I'm out, I'm trying to you know see what I can. Um, so it was really, it, this was a different thing for me to be like, you know what? I'm just going to admit it. I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm smitten with this yeah. piece, you know? The other piece, you know, that, that I, I went to many, you know, repeatedly, uh, was the temple, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. um, it was just 
It was an amazing temple. It was just <sighs> I, perfect. I, I talked to some people that it didn't um, connect with them, but mm. to me, it just hit me so powerfully. I, I yeah. felt like the, you know, as you go in, as you walk into it, it's so on the ground and in your face and very personal and very right. visceral. And then as you get into the center, as, as it kind of takes you up, mm-hmm. it, it had that kind of old school cathedral feeling where it yeah. just brings the energy into this, 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 it, this feeling that's just so much bigger and so much, um, grander than, than any individual. And, and, uh, I, 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 my experience this year was, um, uh, was very, the whole week was affected uh, by the loss of one of our campmates, uh, yeah. Nick Cowthon. He passed a few months ago and w- so we've had a lot of, of camp experiences and, and processing and, and, I've done quite a bit of public processing about it. And, and I actually, honestly, I thought I was a little, I was kind of dreading having to deal with so much of, I'm, I would, I knew Nick stuff was going to be about the burn. And I was kind of like, yeah. I think I'm over this. I really don't want to have to process anymore or, but it, I was so wrong. <laughs> you know, um, we had, a uh, uh, one of his exes, Rima, made this incredible altar that stayed in uh, Pink Heart for the beginning of the week, and then we brought it out to the temple. And so when I when I went into the temple and was just overwhelmed by, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to keep keep my composure. But and I went in and I and I saw amongst all of this, then this um, this piece that was dedicated to Nick, and it had this photograph of him. Um, taken at Burning Man with this, this light pick, this, uh, this, uh, a heart light. So he's got hearts in his eyes and I sit down and I'm, uh, looking into Nick's eyes and it, it was this incredibly beautiful, like it was almost like post grieving. Like I wasn't sad and I wasn't like, why? Because I felt like I'd gone through so much of that. Yeah. But in this moment I was like, I was spending time with him. You know, I was like, this is we're I'm with Nick right now. And, and, and in that space, I lost it. And I was just crying like, and and I so love that the temple gives you a place where whatever you respond is totally cool. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you want to, you want to like snot flying whale, then this is the place that you can do that. And I, I, I've over the years I've, I've actually, I, cr- I can't wait to have that experience. I've called it now ecstatic grieving. Like I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I lose myself. I almost go to like another transcendent plane. That's where I felt like I was with Nick in this place. And, and, uh, and during the process, somebody came up to me and held me and they were like, they said, you're so beautiful when you cry, which I thought was the best thing to say, you know, yeah. not like it's going to be okay because it was perfect. I was not like, I would nothing was wrong. It just was so intense and I couldn't contain the emotions of it. And, and to hear them say that it, 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 it I just, I just held on to them and just kept crying. And, um, and it's such a, it, it's such a gift to be able to, to go so deep in a public place and know that you are held literally and, you know, spiritually by this community. When I, when I finally kind of came out of it and kind of walked like almost dizzy walking out of the place, I felt so light and so cleansed. I felt, I mean, and I, I literally was like, what the fuck do I do now? Like, like, like I feel like I'm a different person than I was an hour ago. I, I guess I go get a snow cone, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's, but it's so like, I was the, if, if, if that was the only experience I had at Burning Man, it would have been worth all the money, all the planning, all the driving, everything. Because that like a moment like that is, is such a high, high frequency experience of human emotion that it, it kind of, it's the high water mark for me of what being alive is. Right. Right. Yeah. I, um, I'm keeping my composure as well right now, but if we both start crying on this podcast, I have no problem with that either. Uh, me neither. We can, neither. we can, we can do that. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, <laughs> I've cried um, very publicly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I've, I've cried more in the past two weeks than I have like in the past like couple of years. Uh, it's, it's, 
that experience of being, by the way, leaving Burning Man like that, it, it doesn't, it didn't feel like leaving. It felt like being ripped out of a wall. Oh. It felt, it was very traumatic. The whole experience was extremely traumatic. But uh, a lot of what you were describing right now and about um, the, the, the beautiful thing that the person who was comforting you said, um, that's, that subject is something that I've been thinking a lot about in the past, uh, in the past couple of weeks, because a lot of the default world's programming, um, you know, first there's like compartmentalization of, oh, okay, this is where you're supposed to feel sad. And then this is where you're supposed to feel happy and you're not allowed to mix the two. Right. Um, whereas like at the temple, for example, it's a perfect example. The temple is in the middle of, um, one of the many, descriptions you could give of burning man arguably is it's the world's biggest most amazing party right and yet in the middle of it in the middle of whatever mode you happen to be in uh, there's people there's i mean just for example walking around a temple like there are people that are looking spiritual as fuck and then there's people that are looking sexy as fuck yep. and there's people that are high and people that are not i mean right. there's no it, it's not like some wall was put up about oh no wait only this kind of serious person is allowed in right, here right, right, right. now You're like you know get your, you can't go be serious right? all this people this burst into bullshit. laughter at yeah, times yeah, you know? yeah yeah and there's nothing not, that's not, not wrong not yeah not not that only there's nothing wrong with that like that's yes it is the all it's the oneness of human emotion like it's all happening at the same time and for that person to come and say to you what they did like that is, you know, it's beautiful words. Um, that's a lot of what I've been grappling with because the past couple of weeks have been like particularly rough. And when they do get this kind of rough, I, I do start to go back to, um, uh, how much I feel for lack of a better description, encouraged <laughs> sometimes I almost feel this. I know this is my own perception, but like sometimes I feel like encouraged to look, look at, um, medication, antidepressants. Uh -huh. Um, and again, like not, not that there's anything wrong with like whatever assistance we need, but I, I kind of like look at that and I look at like, I'm like, oh, all right, am I looking at this just because I'm looking for a way to plug back in because I want the emotions to shut down? Ooh, man. I can't, and that's like, I that's can't, something I struggle with a lot. I can't tell you how topical this is. So I, 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 I've, I've just gotten a lot more into personal coaching and I just started this uh, coaching program called the Pink Path that's really influenced by my burning man experiences. But one of the huge things that keeps coming up is not, uh, is getting comfortable with awkwardness or discomfort yeah. because our instinct is when we have uncomfortableness or sadness or is to, to stop it, to make it go away. Like is to, or you're, you know, you're approaching someone that you're interested in and you feel nervous. You're like, okay, like I want to stop this. What do I do to stop this negative feeling? But the reality is many, many times that awkwardness, that discomfort is evidence, is evidence that you are stepping into your warrior path, that you are going into the discomfort. You're going into the out of your comfort zone and exactly what you need to be. And so like by trying to change my narrative and, and, and I'm of like, Oh, this, this doesn't feel good. Right. Like pat myself on the back for now. Keep, keep going because this is the, the this feeling is n your old script was get away from this. Yeah. The new script is, this is evidence that you are in, you know, being brave. Yeah. Cause it just even, um, the instinct that a lot of times people in the default have about, instead of saying, you know, you look beautiful when you cry, they say, you know, they're there, it'll all be okay. Like there, it is it, to some, totally. a lot of times it's because they're uncomfortable with the feeling and they want it to go away as fast as possible. It's Just, okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. No more tears. No tears. <laughs> it's okay. You're like, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and again, like I, I you know, we've, we've, on this show, we spent a lot of time talking about like, uh, mental health challenges and medication and stuff. You know, I'm not, um, you know, I, <sighs> I'm undecided personally. Uh, I think that there is absolutely um, people in situations with which, you know, medication is the assist that you need in that particular um, challenge. I also fully understand that uh, a lot of it's like temporary. It's not like you're going to be, you know, a pill popper for the rest of your life. It's just that like, for me, I don't, it, for some reason, I just, I keep finding myself in this weird situation where I'm starting to be like, should I? <laughs> I mean, but then when I, when I align with sort of where I'm supposed to be, that darkness goes away. Oh, that's awesome. 
I mean, so full disclosure, I was uh, medicated for anxiety and depression for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have no regrets. I feel like it helped me tremendously and it helped even it helped to teach me ways that my brain should have been working you know yeah. I, I didn't know that what was wrong until i was on medication yeah. and it kind that's of, what the description is usually people say I, I i can't believe i waited this long to do it right and 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 i'm also i'm so glad i'm not on anymore you know <laughs> yeah. but uh but so i'm i'm I, my general feeling is like uh better living by any means necessary yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh so if i i'm a big believer in in medication if it helps, but also in recognizing that it should be a part of a, of a program, right? You know, that there's, I believe that, that the reason why I don't use it anymore is because I've trained my brain to, to work differently yeah. and it practice different things. And I have tools, but when you don't, it's a combination of chemical tools and, you know, mental tools that I think get your brain or I mean, whatever, whatever works for whatever right, person, right, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you need, you need the assist. Uh, you yeah. know, it, it could be, I don't know, like an example that pops into my head is that if you're really dehydrated, drinking just like regular water might not be enough. Like we gotta, we gotta, uh, you know, get some Gatorade in you, or right. <laughs> get some right. electrolytes in you. And then right. now you're back to being hydrated. Now you can think clearly, then you can get back to drinking the normal amount of water that you're probably supposed to be drinking. Right. Um, can, and, uh, and, we're gonna, and from that clarity, then you might be able to make decisions better right. in the future. And they go, right. Oh, I don't need Gatorade. I just know that I now need to drink every 15 minutes or, or <laughs> yes, something yes, like yes, that. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Yeah. Can I, uh, we're going to get back to Burning Man just again, but uh, sure. <laughs> um, do you, do, I, I have to ask, um, you don't have to necessarily disclose like all the details, but like emotionally, what was, was there like a feeling that you had, did it like feel right when you decided to uh, accept the medication? <sighs> So I was, I was fresh out of college hmm. and I, I spent a day at a mall walking in and out of retail stores, wanting to get an application to get a job and right. being so freaked out and starting to panic and, and leave. And I'm like, I'm a college graduate decorated all these, like, like I, I should not be so scared about this. And so I talked to a doctor. I was like, is this, is there something like wrong. And they said, do you want to try, you know, medication? And when I tried the medication, I was like, at this point I'm, I'm feeling weak enough that I want to try. Right. And I, I, you know, it took like two weeks or so before the buildup of, of medication in me. And, and then I had this, it, it wasn't like, Oh, I feel different. It was just like one day I was like, I'm not thinking about what I should be doing right now. Right. 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 And my life used to be constantly right. I should be doing this 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 and it, and and when I when I I stopped having that thought it wasn't like aha it just at one day I realized I'm not having that thought anymore mm. and the thing that also I, I would help me to to uh to learn was occasionally I would be in situations where I would start to feel like the world sucked yeah. actually I take that back I didn't feel like the world sucked I saw the world as sucking, you yeah, know, and I yeah. knew it sucked and I could often trace back and say, Oh, I missed medication two days, three days ago. So now I'm feeling a dip in the medication. So I, I know that there's something happening in my brain right. that is making me have this thought. And when I finally was able to kind of make that connection and know that, Oh, there's a difference between the world sucking mm. and me thinking the world sucks. Right. 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 And, I now, because enough practice, I now, like, I know that, and I, I start to recognize signs that I'm not thinking clearly. Like, if I start saying, I always do this, I never do this, I always let people down, people never do this, and I'm like, oh, that's my broken brain talking. Yeah. So, I need to chill out, watch a movie, stop making big decisions, and 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 work my way through this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what you're describing, I, I, I had that... Um... <sighs> I, I, I had that experience, uh, when I got into uh, meditation, um, mm -hmm. after like enough of that, at some point there was, I remember having that clarity. It's still not quite as easy. Like one of the stories that I've told on the show quite a few times too, is that like the meditation was, was kind of getting me to that place. And then when I sort of had my first complete ego death experience, that's when it really like stuck uh -huh. like that awareness. Um, but then it feels like, you know, other things happen in life. You get a few years go by and um, 
some of that other, some of that, that thinking that you're describing can kind of like sneak back in. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah that, like that's one of the reasons why I try to talk about this stuff as mm -hmm. often as I can, when it comes up for me is to remind myself and others that it is a constant practice. Right, right, right. You don't just go, ah, I've learned that life is good and we're all connected. Therefore, I can go on with my life and never <laughs> yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah. No, you forget. Yeah. I mean, it, you're constantly forgetting and the media is constantly reminding you what's wrong with you. And there's like, I, I'm a, a, a big believer in like starting the day. I have a list of b statements about myself. I am a loving vessel. I am this, I'm this. Because if I don't remind myself first thing in the morning, then the first email I get will define who I am. Yeah. And I'm, Oh, I got to fix this. You know? and, and suddenly I'm in defense mode and I'm yeah. like panicking, trying to, and I've forgotten that, wait, I, I am a person that, you know, lifts people up. I am this. And, um, the brain is, uh, a pretty fragile and weak tool if you just let it go willy nilly. Yeah. 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 Um, taking it back to burning man. Yes. Um, uh, no, it, it, it completely on that topic. Like that's cause one of the experiences that we have is we find ourselves in this environment and in this community where we do get more and more of that supportive response when we are feeling all of the feelings, whatever, whatever happens to be coming up. Yeah. Um, and that to some extent can almost get just as confusing because <laughs> I'm like, all right, oh, uh, I feel like crying. And they're like, it's okay. You look beautiful when you cry. Right. Uh, I'm laughing today. It's okay. You look beautiful when you laugh. I'm like, oh my God, is, can I do anything wrong? <laughs> where, where does the control come in? I think that's one of the most profound gifts of Burning Man is, is that when most of us are live an entire lifetime of doing what we should do and acting the way we should act. And we're in it was some form or another, we are playing the role that we're supposed to act. Right. And then you get to the playa and people go, you don't have to do that. You, whatever you're doing is fucking awesome. Yeah. Like wh whatever you want to express is awesome. Whatever you want to act out, whatever you want to sing, whatever you want to dance, whatever you want to cry, whatever, you, if it's you, we're radically inclusive, you know, it's radical self-expression. And if it's real and it's authentic yeah. then we celebrate it. And that support is, it, it can change your whole life. It's yeah. a, that's what the, I've heard the term permission engine, you know, like Bernie permission. a permission engine. Okay. Like most of our lives, we are acting from a place of, I should do this. I should do this. I should yeah. do this. And Burning Man gives you permission. Like let, no, don't do what you should do. Yeah. We give you permission to let out whatever's inside you, whatever your truth is. And it's such a novel experience that that's what gives birth to insane art yeah. and life transformation and world change is because like that is such a rare gift that permission. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this, uh, um, there is this, you can almost, you can almost see it like after you've been burning long enough, like I'm sure you can, you've been burning so much longer. Um, like the, this shift in people's consciousness and even like in their body language. Oh, totally. Like, yeah. When you see like somebody like, you know, a virgin, their first year is like, uh, not every virgin's this way, obviously, but sure. like we've met like some virgins that like maybe come from like the hardcore party scene or rave scene or whatever. And they're, they're out there like trying to show off. And like, you can kind of see on like the faces of like the older burners, like watching it, like, oh yeah, I've seen you before. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. You'll break down soon <laughs> right, enough. Right. That's it. it it's, and even like, you know, a, a couple of years in, you have this kind of eagerness mm. and like a desire to make sure everybody knows that how, how cool everything is. Yeah. And then you kind of get through it and you're like, it's all good. Yeah. It's all going to work out and whatever, whatever your feelings, perfect. And, and I'm not going to convince you of anything. Yeah. We're going to ride out this storm and then we're going to celebrate the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of storms, uh, Weather was pretty fucking good this oh year. Oh my god! So <laughs> I showed up this year on Friday before the burn, yeah. and uh, my teammates, my build team, had got there uh, Wednesday. Mm. And compared to last year, when they're building in like 110, yeah. and this year they're building in like 80 and breeze, you know, 88 or something. It it went so much faster. It was so much more enjoyable. Um, the whole week, you know, was like we had a little bit of wind. Like it was yeah. a pretty windy yeah. Wednesday night. It was a pretty crazy whiteout, you know, and yeah. that was a little stressful, but, um, for the most part, I, you couldn't script a more pleasant weather. Yeah. Not no, too hot. Well, nights were super warm. 
No, it really was perfect. I, you know, I had a, um, a, a friend who um, worked with the psych services and she was saying that like one of the patterns that they noticed is that the much hotter years, um, like the previous year were years when they would get like more um, uh, domestic disturbance calls and stuff. Yeah. So like when the heat is up, like people do get more irritable. More Isn't that, up. that was an old Kathleen Turner movie about that? Something heat. Something heat. They talk about that when it gets Night hot. Maybe Dark, I don't know. Something like that. Anyway, but that, <laughs> I, I, I totally believe it. I mean, it's it's hard Flashback. not to be irritable when when you uh yeah. when you're just too hot. A lot of people had heat stroke uh, last year. This year, I just remember there was like a constant conversation of like just how nice the yeah. the weather was. Well, I mean, like last year, you know, Pinkart we give away ice water, mm. and last year we gave away I can't remember it was something like five to seven thousand gallons like like we gave away so much water because it was a medical necessity as opposed to like oh that's nice ice water yeah. and this year was more like nice and uh i i much prefer it being a a pleasant gift than a, than a, than a medical need yeah yeah the so the um the nasa space blanket uh, art piece. The orb? Yeah, okay. So it, what, that was it, right? I, I think so. Because <laughs> here's what happened. I, I, th- I saw it hanging. The, the big at, scrotum? Right. <laughs> right. The big silver scrotum? I'm like, is that done? Yeah. That's pretty gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I mean, I kept seeing it from a distance and there was something that I kept wanting to check out and I, by the time the screaming and crying and pain started happening, I didn't get a closer uh, up look. Did you I mean, didn't get any close to it? No, I got the, when it was full. I mean, okay. It was, it was, uh, I thought they were going to like cover the plier or something. That, I, I didn't know if that was two different things. Okay. I, but I, So that's what I thought too. I thought there was one that was going to be a big um, shade structure, or yeah. like shade sail. And then there was another one that was going to be the massive disco ball. And maybe, maybe they are two different things, but all I saw out there was the massive right. disco ball. Yeah. That was the big, but I, I think it was the same kind of mylar material that you could kind of see through when the, when the sun was shining through it. And I thought that was, I loved it because yeah, yeah. I thought it was like, it was such a different thing to see on the playa and like, you know, <laughs> there'd be a dust storm and you see it, it looked, it looked like the, the scene in uh, star Wars when, when uh, Luke Skywalker's got the two moons behind yeah, him. Yeah, like, yeah. like, like you just see that big orb. You're like, this is definitely a, another planet. Yeah. 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 It, it, you know, it, there was a, a listener of ours, I think said this. Um, I, I don't remember. I think it was like a message exchange or something that we're having. I could be wrong, but, uh, he said, um, uh, this person was visiting from, uh, uh, from Europe. And I said, like, what made you want to come to Burning Man? He said, it's because he read that it was written about Burning Man, that it is, uh, Salvador Dali's fever dream come true. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think that's selling it short. Yeah. <laughs> but, so I, I had the awareness this year that, um, you know, I'll look, I'll go through my Facebook feed and I'll yeah. see people post some like super cool bridge in Thailand or some cool massive Buddha sculpture. Did you see that bridge in Vietnam though with the yeah. hands? That thing's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Okay. <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about. Well, yeah. like, like where you see that and you go, let's go there. Yeah. Let's spend three weeks yeah. and fly and then drive and then take a bus to see that thing. I know. But then Bernie man, you see 50 things that are almost as that awesome or more awesome in the course of a I night. Know. You're just like one after the other. You almost like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, but there's something so cool right there. So yeah. let's, we got to go. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the next coolest thing. And then there's the next, and by the way, also I'm with the coolest people that I want to hang out with. Exactly. Whereas like, I mean, I, I would love to go see that bridge in Vietnam, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be like, okay, I saw the bridge in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> like, now I'm at, all right. Now what next? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I had a, uh, a person I, that I talked to a few years ago and they were saying, look, I'm, I'm not the kind of person, like I never thought I would go to Burning Man because mm-hmm. I'm not into raves. I don't like partying. But the more I talk to people, the more I realize that they said, what if there was a city that attracted the most brilliant minds in the world, the greatest artists in the world, and that city existed for one week? Would you want to visit that city? <laughs> I mean, as a traveler, as, a, as yeah. someone who's trying to experience everything the world has to offer, I was like, well, clearly my answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's funny too, because the, just even, I feel like what has happened is that since Burning Man's like really like coming more to the mainstream consciousness, um, uh, I mean, you're seeing it more and more like yeah. in recent years, there is now 
it feels like now there's like a backlash of travelers who are making it a point not to go to Burning Man. They're like, I've been talking to people like that. They're like, oh yeah, you know, and I'll get to it. I really want to travel and see the world. I just don't want to be around a bunch of dusty hippies the whole time. I feel like I, I end up spending a lot of time talking to people about what's changed about Burning Man. And I mean, this year is a really interesting one because of the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian. Oh yeah. And you know, my parents and tons of my parents' friends have seen articles in Time and Newsweek and not like crazy rave in the desert. It's like world-class art happening at Burning Man. And so it's, even though like when they ask me, is that that rave in the desert? And I say, no, (laughs) they don't quite believe me until they see the Smithsonian write up. And they're like, holy crap, you were right. This is a significant movement. I'm like, I told you. So that I think has been a huge, uh, player in, in, in the kind of global shift in, in the way people look at what we're doing. Um, getting in the weeks after Burning Man, my parents kept cutting out political cartoons hmm. that referenced Burning Man in some way. I mean, and it wasn't, they weren't even about Burning Man. It was just like, used like Burning Man is an example of some artistic expression. And I was like, yeah. yeah, we're, it's, it's a, we are no longer underground. And, and the truth is that is bringing with it all sorts of, consequences, right. whether it's people who show up and do not go through basic acculturation, don't understand the principles, don't understand participation, or the fact that if you have enough resources and you are going to see the coolest things in the world and you have the money to do whatever you want, you go to Burning Man. Yeah. And so we have, you know, the plug and play type struggles where, and, and I, you know, I think we've talked about this in the past, like it's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you have when you, when everybody knows this is one of the coolest things in the world, mm-hmm. um, people who are collectors of experience and not willing to dedicate the energy to be a part of it will find their way there. And, yeah. and there's a, there is a danger. And, and, and one of the, the, the consequences that I find to be the, the most scary is when you have uh, professional burners and you have classes of burners, when you have people who are paid to build and, and, and set up yeah. and gift. And then you have other people who are the, um, simply the receivers of that. Right. That's the old model of entertainers and entertained. And, and the whole magic of Burning Man is there's just a stage and everybody's on it. Mm-hmm. But then when you start having, well, but you're a stage hand and you're, the, it's like, ah, that's, yeah. that's really dangerous to, to the, to the vibe. One of the dangers is because when you have a guy who is, you know, paid, to be there and brought to do there. And then the guy in the camp next to him does all of it for free. Right. Last year he felt so good about the gift he gave this year. He feels a little bit like a sucker. Yeah. 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 I've heard some people even describe uh, how like the art, um, mind you, I'm, I'm, I am not complaining about the art personally. Um, but like, yeah, the, the description has been given like, man, yeah, there was a time where, you know, you could like kind of ratchet something together and duct tape it and zip tie it. And, um, you know, now there's like so much professionalism put into the art that some of the smaller guys are feeling intimidated. Yeah. Like that's a description that I've heard some people, I don't know. Um, I've seen lots of people like kind of roll up their sleeves and say, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to give this a shot. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see that happening because I still think that there's tons of lo-fi and, you know, non-experienced art that's awesome right. and cool and it's super expressive. We had in front of our camp, uh, Kurt and Stephanie did a uh, zap, yeah. you know, this uh, praying mantis that spit fire. You know, they're not massively funded, professionally trained artists. They're people with passion and they made something awesome. Right. And tons of people loved it. Um and I don't think, you know, people are like looking at it going, well, this isn't as impressive as <laughs> like, no, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's, and it's just, I wonder when I see some of the scale and some of the, clearly the money that has to go into these, it's like, mm-hmm. what has to happen to bring that kind of art here? And what, if there's patrons that are, that are saying, I want to gift this to the, to the world, which that's my hope, then right. that's awesome. You know, like I, I would imagine that if you were a certain level of wealth and you're like, you know, you know, before Bezos just d- develops his Mars um, colony, yeah. he should build something awesome and blow people's minds at Burning Man. Uh, I don't know. I, I, did, I, you, it, did you make it out to Mayan Warrior at all? Not at all. I never saw Mayan Warrior this year. That was one of the things. I mean, we were. I mean, a bunch of my friends were going to the Mayan Warrior party in LA. 
and they were like, we want to go see Myron Warrior. I'm like, well, we're going to fucking go see Myron Warrior in a week out in right. the desert in like the best party in the world. And then I, you know, didn't make it. But <laughs> I was really hoping that there was some sort of review about what it looked like now. I mean, I, well, actually, no, I, I saw it from a distance yeah. and like the lasers and the, the, it's, I'm actually not a big laser guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I love LED art. And I, in the, this year, actually, Pink Heart had a, uh, a beacon that we created uh, mm. that uh, Kiwi and other artist Craig worked on this LED stuff and watching how difficult it was to do LED programming. Right. We actually did not finish. We had to punt and do a non-programmed static kind yeah. of LED. It, it watching how hard it was gave me this insane respect for what it takes to create some of the, the work yeah. out there. I, I, yeah. I mean, you, you look at like the, there was the rainbow and it would have all these animations and all these things. You can't just like type into your laptop, make pretty pattern. Yeah, you, you, have yeah. to, you have to map yeah. every dot. And then yeah. it's, it, it's, it's so crazy. That's why the thing, the hexatron, when I saw that and realized like, it's like Mozart, like genius to, to be able to visualize all this stuff and then mm-hmm. make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what other uh, art pieces did you you were describing? There was a couple of them that you were going back to multiple times. Uh, oh gosh, no. I'm, no you're on I can t- I can tell you the one that that I missed that I regret the most. Mm. There's two that that everyone talked about that I missed that I've been looking at pictures going like, oh, one is the uh, in every lifetime I'll find you, which okay. is these two figures that was like this like polished metal oh yeah that was gorgeous oh, i mean like i, I did cheer up as, as I, when i when i yeah. people tell me it's called this i was like bah, 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 bah. yeah um, and it was so beautiful and then the other one was like the sonic runway which are these yeah. uh that as the music played it that was, was the same sonic runway as the, that was there two years ago right i missed it then too oh, really it, yeah. you missed it both years in a row uh, oh my god yeah no that was uh that i remember we rode through that multiple times uh it was, so it, was awesome. it was so much fun all of a sudden you're like in a spaceport <laughs> riding on your bicycle. <laughs> I mean, it, it, honestly, I'm, I'm a poor reporter for you because mm. I spend so much time at pink Art, you know, yeah, we're yeah. Esplanade, and there's just, we have, there's constantly people there and I get so much joy from talking to people and, 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 and a lot of people come who have seen how to yeah. videos I've made. And so like trying to like answering those questions, like how does Burning Man used to be different? Like I, I, I love, uh, being able to be a little bit of a Burning Man elder to people if they yeah. want to hear stuff and 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 gift people and hug people and um and part of it is that this is my twenty first year so the 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 joy of spending four hours in deep playa right. is is not as intense as the joy of hugging a hundred people yeah know? yeah yeah I, I, I think. I want to say Monday night or Sunday night. I ran into you. Uh-huh. You were exploring solo. You know what's funny? Yeah. Like three minutes before I saw you, I was with a crew of people, and then I oh. saw the opulent temple fire, and I'm like, <gasps> I just got drawn to it. And next yeah. thing I knew, I'd lost them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I ask if that was like a thing that you do, like a solo solo night trick. You know, I I often do, but mm. this year I had I because I, I run with, into you solo multiple times at Burning Man. I I yeah. But my. my I actually spent a lot of time leading up to the burn, mm. um, making expectations clear with friends and lovers that I follow impulse at right. Burning Man. You know, like I, I, there's certain things that I do that I, that I, I sign up for. I do talks and I will be there and I will give it my best. And, and I did, did quite a few this time, but mm. when I'm in freedom mode, I am often like someone says, Hey, I'm going to the bathroom. Wait for me here. I'm like, maybe <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll do my best unless something awesome comes yeah. along and then I'm following it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. That sounds really like, I feel like I'd, I'd be getting absolute like performance anxiety in the bathroom trying to piss <laughs> as fast well, as possible because the house going to ditch me. Well, I did. I did have some date nights this, mm. this year with people where, you know, I committed to, to hanging out and, and I'm so glad I did. Yeah. Um, but w- w- with, without that established expectation, like I'm, I'm not the guy that goes out with a group of 10 and we spend five minutes rounding everybody up and then right. we go to the next thing right. we grab a group of 10. I, I, I just, um, I find so much pleasure in just floating. Right. Yeah, yeah. So much magic that just, I run into when I do that. You know, it just, on another note, like earlier we were talking about, let's see, you know, let's the city in the world where all the cool shit in the world is happening right there. And it's only on public. When you were describing that, by the way, um, I was thinking about it. Maybe it happened like right after I saw you at some point they had that, the drones. I never saw that. The drone show. You heard about it? Yeah. I saw videos of it. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it was, it was definitely one of those moments where like I look 
in this direction and there's this flying drone show happening in the sky and then there's fire being shot over here and another light thing over here and 75 other light things here and it was definitely a moment of holy shit where am i you know and and the funniest part is that we're looking at it and one person from our group goes come on guys we got to make it to the other thing don't worry about it drone's gonna be there tomorrow (laughs) that's that's where we've come this is one of the coolest things you've ever seen but let's go yeah 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 don't worry there's gonna be like 50 other cool things (laughs) um what were some of the talks that you gave uh, the first one I gave, I, every year I, I talked to the Black Rock Explorers, mm. which is the Kidsville group. So yeah. I give a talk to like, you know, kids from three to 12 about gifting. Yeah. And, uh, there's a camp mate of mine, Cookie, who brings thousands of cookies. And so go to Kidsville with boxes of hundreds of cookies and, nice. um, and try to explain to them about gifting and what that means. And, and, and it's so fun. Cause I'm like, who's got a great gift? And they're like, me, me. And the way I try to explain it to them, I'm, I'm like, like it's fun to eat a cookie, right? And like, but it's also fun to give away a cookie, isn't it? They're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, how many cookies do you think you could eat? Yeah. Could you eat three? Yeah. Could you eat five? Yeah. Could you eat ten? Like one kid's like, I could eat. I'm like, all right. <laughs> could you eat a hundred cookies? No. Yeah. Could you give away a hundred cookies? Yeah. yeah. Could you give away five hundred cookies? Yeah. We have 500 cookies to give away. <laughs> and then we put rubber gloves on the kids and they go out yeah. into the street and give away cookies. And it's just like, oh, it's so awesome. You know, at some point we, we rode by a camp. There was a little like a lemonade stand type thing outside of it. And it's a sign that said taking candy from strangers. <laughs> and it was a bunch of kids giving out candy. No. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's great. great. That's, I have, yeah. we have a, we used to have a no kids rule at Pink Heart. And then a bunch of our, well, a couple of our, hardcore members got very fertile and yeah. ended up having babies. <laughs> and so, so now we've got, um, uh, Dimitri and OT have got, uh, yeah. Diego, Una and Noah, these three beautiful little, little children. And it, and it, it's, it's so, it's such a magical little accent mm-hmm. to Burning Man to see children playing in it, you know, right. and see, and the way, and the way people react to, to children, you know, it's cause like a lot of people are falling into that play mode right. and then you see a kid and just like, whew, they just like rushes come through you. Are you, uh, are you, have you always been good with kids? Um, I'm always, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm good with other people's kids. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. I'm good in, in, in short bursts. I think I'm yeah. good at being able to be childish and childlike. So the, I've had an interesting thing that I'm, that I'm still very much in the process of exploring in my own personal journey. Um, uh, long story short, I had an epiphany in therapy that, uh, uh, I need to sort of like parent the child within me a little bit more and that there may be some sort of a connection with my not being comfortable <laughs> around, around like, uh, uh, a lot of kids. And it's not, I don't know. It's hard to describe. It's not all kids. Like I'll shift on and off, but whatever that is, that's connected to my own kid yeah. issues from my own time as a kid. Interesting. Um, but at burning man and in that kind of environment, I see the kids there and it really does bring me a lot of joy. And I've been in situations where I've had conversations, like I, there are people that I've had conversations with. They're like, this is supposed to be, you know, they feel so, they feel super uncomfortable when there's a kid around because they feel like they're not allowed to like let loose. Uh, and, I used to feel that way. I, I'm yeah. Like that yeah. And I remember, I, I think I've had this conversation with people in the past. I'm like, well, do you think you're doing something wrong? And I'm like, well, no. I'm like, okay, well then that, you know, that thing, I think that the fear that you have around being around children is because you've been, it's social programming. Like right. you're doing some, you're rebelling against society by, you know, being drunk or whatever it is right, that you're right. high or whatever. So like the, if, if you don't think you're doing anything wrong and you're being a responsible person and you have your shit together, um, nobody's asking you to drive a truck or you know, right. have you left over. It's just, or, or, or you're, you're not even asked being asked to be a role model for this kid. Right. The parents are still there parenting. Right. That, we, we had a time when, a, when, a, uh, like late in the game, a parent said they're going to bring their kids with them to yeah. a camp. This was like 12 years ago. And I was like, I was pissed because I had a whole like live sex performance that I wanted to do, you know? And I was like, <laughs> what? And, um, and, and the parents, changed my whole person. They like, they go, look, we don't think anything wrong happens at Burning Man. Right. And we, we parent our kids and in a city, a default world city, we have to do a lot of parenting and we have to protect our kids and we have to explain to them when they see things that we are, are problematic. And we do the same thing at Black Rock City, but it's actually way easier. There's way less things that we need to protect them from that we need to explain to them. But if they see something, if they see your live sex show, we will talk to them and we'll explain to them what that was. And I'm like, all right, cool. That, that, that freed me. 
God, I want to be a fly in the wall in that conversation. Okay. I got another crazy, um, parenting thing Please. for you. So, um, you know, I do a, a weekly podcast where I talk about burner stuff and other things. Um, and during it, I, I was joking that I, I had a vasectomy eight years ago and I froze some sperm mm. and just in case, just in case I've been thinking about that a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> like and, just in case. And, um, and I, but I've been paying for the storage yeah. for, and they, you know, it's like, they literally have me by the ball. Yeah. They have to, you know, <laughs> I, I have to pay whatever they say. So wait, you but, can't just put that in the freezer. Can you imagine someone coming over for a brunch and be like, <laughs> is this? No, 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 don't no, eat that. No. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, so they, I, I was kind of joking on the broadcast that I don't, I still don't have the desire to be a parent, mm. but I do feel this kind of like genetic ache to mm. participate in this grand DNA experiment of humanity. And so if there's, you know, someone out there that's wanting to get a donor, you know, I'd be willing, you know, whether a lesbian couple or something. Yeah. And I'd love to be uncle John. Like I'd love to know the kid and not parent it, but be, be in you heard life. it here folks. Yeah. One of you listeners. Want- well, let me keep going with the story because I, as soon as I got off the air, yeah. a woman contacted me. Uh-huh. And so for the next eight months, we were in correspondence going through all sorts of legal stuff. Oh, and wow. as the, the kid that the, the, um, the fetus is now cherry size. She posted today. What? I am, there is the, I am the, the genetic parent of a, ch- of a child what? in uterus right now. <laughs> That's a amazing. burner, a burner is going to have <laughs> oh my a God. child that, uh, it's got my genetic material in it. it oh, wow. I, 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 there's so many questions <laughs> was, did she come to the burn? She did. So she went to the birth, bur- not this year, not this year because she is just pregnant. Okay. Um, last year she went to the burn for the first time. She's this amazing person. Really? Yeah. She's, she's like, she's like a combat veteran and, and like just this powerful, awesome woman. Wow. And, uh, and that's when we got to know each other. I was like, like, Oh, you, you would be a great mom. Um, this year she wanted to go to the burn, but then her doctors are like, you know, if it's as hot as last year, you're just getting started. You're right. Kind of, the, the safer thing to do would be to not to go. Oh, interesting. But she'll be back. She would have been fine though. Cause the weather was really good. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of thing like well, those are those mistakes. Like what if you miscarried yeah. and you went, you, how would you forgive yourself? Yeah. 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 This, so did you, were you looking at burning man with very different eyes this year? Now with this knowledge that there is, your seed is growing in a combat veteran. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's an interesting, I mean, I wasn't looking at it differently, but yeah. in a lot of ways I look at everything differently, mm. you know, because there's a different worldview that you have when you think that your concept of this dimension ends with your death. Right. And I'm sure, I mean, I'm, I'm super, I have no right to talk about this because I'm not a parent, but you know, people who are true parents, I'm not, I'm, I'm a sperm donor, not a parent. Right. There's a difference. Um, but you know, when you have offspring, then your relationship to the world is there's more responsibility right. and there's, it's, it's deeper. And so I have started to have a little bit of those feelings that I can't, um, I can't be like, I don't care. I, yeah. you know, like I've already decided I'm, I'm checking out and whatever. If I live another 40 years, sweet. If not, whatever you guys can deal with this and knowing that, you know, that, that there's at least genetically that, um, my lineage continues and changes things a little bit. Wow. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> so I'm um, now I'm recycling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought about that a lot. Uh, I, I, the older I got, the less interested I was in having kids. And I think it's more because I was just making more peace with, um, what, you know, uh, what I'm allowed and not allowed to do yeah. as a citizen. Yep. Cause in my you know upbringing, there was so much pressure from society and my culture to like reproduce. And like one day I was like, wait, I don't fucking have to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, I feel like I get a lot of fulfillment from, um, something you were referencing earlier, which is like from yours, like being like the elder burner and helping Mm -hmm. with the culturation. Like I get a lot of that value from helping artists um, and like building community and putting people in a position where they're able to create art and connect with other people to create projects. And like that really just gives me like such a high. Um, I wonder if like that need for me is being fulfilled in a lot of ways doing that. Interesting. I, I, I definitely, one of the reasons why I, got a vasectomy was because I felt like I put so much energy into 
parental style energy right. into a community or into a congregation and that um, I didn't feel as much of a like a need to do it into a single person because I felt like I, I I feel called to give to lots of people. Right. You know, one, one thing you just said about giving to artists and allowing, um, had a really kind of cool awareness this year at Pink Heart where, um, you know, some art projects, there is a design and then you bring in volunteers to help execute the design. And Pink Heart is something where we have a, idea, you know, and kind of like a, a, a vision, not spe- a specific visual vision, but a vision in terms of the vibe and then a basic structure. And then we, especially for the visual aspect of it, and then we bring out bins and bins of, of fabric and cushions and lights and the people who are part of the build crew, they just keep adding to it until it feels awesome. Yeah. So it's this really cool thing where no one artist said, this is what it's supposed to look like. Right. A bunch of people started to go, how do I think I could add to this and make it cooler? Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's not just visually. Then you have people go, you know what would be cooler is if we had a sit down meal where this happened. Cause now I, now I get the vibe. I want to add to it in this way. And we had a woman, this amazing French cartoonist who's like, I want to make a mural for the camp. You're like, mm-hmm. awesome. You know, and then people go, well, I want to add this. And I had this kind of awareness that like, that's my dream scenario is people feel the love, feel the vibe and go, Ooh, I have this thing inside me right. that I can add to it where it's not like, I'm not, I'm not just a, a pawn or a drone executing on a, on a plan. I'm being allowed to see the direction and then take it in the way that feels right to me. Right. 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 Yeah. And I, I can tell you like, for me, like that's been, um, sort of like the most important part of this experience. Um, so Thursday night we, uh, uh produ- uh, my, my producer rebel Dharma had like orchest- orchestrated a party at burners without borders where, um, uh, calliope and like pretty much like pretty much all the camp Walter show oh, cool. showed up and like all the crew from camp Walter was like saying how like psyched they were to like leave camp and like be able to like drive driver nice. out there. And like, so it was a lot of fun, like, like, you know, talking to like different listeners coming up from various parts of the world and just kind of like uh, having a good time, but also bringing like interesting gifts and things like that. So I bet. yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was really nice, but it, it, it was definitely, I was having this experience where I'm like, you know, I didn't put this together. <laughs> like my producer did and like somebody else did this thing and somebody else did this part. And, um, and it was, it was definitely, I realized like that's something that I've personally gotten from the burning man journey has been learning to like let go of all the little parts of the machine, mm-hmm. you know, um, like accepting that, like, I mean, you know, starting this show, starting this podcast was sort of, you know, just basically the groundwork to have an excuse to do a bunch of other stuff based on this particular thing that we're doing. Right. You know, like this, this, this twice a month show is sort of like, you know, what, what just kind of keeps the story going, but there's all this other stuff that's happening around it through our extended team that's working on projects and doing these things and doing that things. And like one of the stories that I often reference is when you were describing a year that um, it might've been the first year that like you were building pink heart and you kept thanking people right. obsessively right. thanking people like yeah. thank you thank you th- oh my god thank you and you were like almost feeling like guilty like oh my god you guys are doing this whole thing for me and but then all of a sudden it snapped into your realization like no wait a minute like they're doing this for them yeah we're doing this together they're not doing me a favor exactly and it was a really interesting experience to have this ex- like be out there and even in the middle of screaming and pain and crying <laughs> um <laughs> this party is happening and these people are having this amazing time and people are meeting and connecting whom i don't really know they're there because of this thing that we do and it was definitely a moment of like like wow like look at how far we've come and i i am i i i found myself having a much easier time letting go of that guilt Mm. of oh no people are helping me people are doing this thing for this thing i did I, I had a much easier time letting go of that based specifically on hearing your voice over and over in my head <laughs> describing that story oh that makes me happy it was, it was good it was really cool it's you know it's uh and that's one of the things i think burning man wide is that you know when people are given the opportunity to contribute their energy towards something that's freaking awesome yeah 
it's not a sacrifice. It's, it's purpose. Right. You know, and that's, I mean, what are we all hungering for is the ability to, to, to do something purposeful. That's actually, you know, one of the, 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 the challenging and fun and struggles that pink Heart has been going through recently mm-hmm. is, um, you know, with, this was our ninth year. And as we grow and we continue to kind of attain a level of excellence that we never had, I mean, we were very scrappy the first year. And as, as more people contribute their genius to it, it gets better and better and we get a bit more and more dependable. And there was a time when, um, with the first year we just, we did not have shifts for anything. We mm-hmm. just said like, Hey, everybody contribute as you want to. Right. And we figured if, if, you know, if people, if enough people want the water bar open, then they'll work it. And if it's not open, no big deal. But as it's become almost like a staple and people depend on it, then we got, we feel like we have to have it open. So we have shifts mm-hmm. and, and what it didn't, it, it did not, the big lessons of this year was that the huge difference between waking up and feeling like, Ooh, I feel like working the water bar today versus having on your work shift, you know, like I have to work the water bar today. And because if you have to work it, all that you can do is let people down. Yeah. Whereas if you want to work it, then it's a gift that you feel good about. And it's a huge challenge. I know that the more that I've talked about, the more I've heard this from so many theme camps where you struggle with what's it going to take to execute our vision and how can we do it without everybody feeling like this is just like my everyday job where right. I have to do these tasks. And, you know, we're, you know, one of the fun things about Burning Man is the, the iterative nature of the, of the city. You know, every year you break it down. So every year you, you, you have to consciously decide, are we going to do it again that way? Are we going to do it again that way? And so the, the cool part of our current, like, checking back in about how this year went is trying to figure, okay, we got a little heavy on obligation in the, in service of the vision. Can we, what is the way that we can kind of go back to that place of joyful giving and just trust that if we care enough about what we're doing, people will step up when they need to. Right. Right. We'll see. Yeah. I, I um, you know, like last year was the first year that I'd worn a watch to Burning Man. <laughs> um, and it just the way things worked out, I had to be certain places, certain right. times. And, and uh, I remember last year I set the intention that I'm going to remove this like negative association with time. Like, cause that's like a common thing, right? When you ask people like what time it is and they give you a snarky answer right, right. Or, or, or it's either like, or it's like a hippie answer. It's like the time is now like <laughs> the time, the time doesn't matter. Oh, shut the fuck up. I need okay, to be somewhere. There's 4 40 children that are waiting for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You go tell the kids who are waiting for their cookies. Time yeah. doesn't matter. Um, but no, I, I, it was, it was interesting. Like that's been a part of the experience that I've had in the past year. And this year, the whole week I had my watch on, mm. um, and I rather enjoyed it. I, I liked knowing what time it was. I liked having a clear answer and like looking forward to the next thing. And it yeah. was a good experience. What, what I try to do is I try to load certain days heavy with responsibility mm, and then yeah, leave yeah, other yeah. days free. Yeah. Because once I've, I've got to be looking at my watch and I've got to talk here and a talk here and a thing here, it's like, okay, then, then I'm, I'm in the zone of, of being responsible right. and I'm not going to follow a butterfly into deep playa and see what, you know, and then I, then I give myself segments of time where I am not going to be there no matter what, you know, like don't depend on me. I'm be like, Hey, we're at this party. And my standard answer is all great. If I'm there, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it, it, I, I imagine like, that's the other thing too, which is, um, I was just thinking like, as we're having this, this part of the conversation uh, about how this, I guess it's official now. This, this is, this is our new annual tradition is our uh, Sweet. Uh, annual post burn decom with, uh, or just the Russian Halcyon. Um, but yeah, it, it, it how our, our ref are originally the idea, the very first episode of these that we did, it was like me, you and, and, and Jake and, and Fred healed and, the idea was more to like stay focused on like questions about the burn and like talk very specifics. And like at this point it's evolved into just like this conversation about 
the general journey and where it takes you because every year we do it, we're in a different place in our own personal journeys and like the things that we pay attention to. Um, it was a fluke this year that I had to leave for a medical emergency, but, but, uh, but just even what you're describing about like the amount of time that you, you know, you spend at pink heart, like hugging more and stuff like that. Um, I imagine every year you're finding that you're doing a little bit more of that. Absolutely. And, and a little bit less following a butterfly in a deep playa. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's like, I sometimes will hear people like after they'll go to Burman three years and they'll say like, I think I've gotten everything I can out of this. Mm. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, I, there's a lot of reasons that I respect saying you don't want to go to Burning Man anymore. But if yeah. you say I don't, I can't get anything out of this anymore. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. like you missed the whole point. I agree. Like I go and I feel like I'm of service most of the time yeah. and, and I love it. I love it. I, I cannot wait to be of service and giving, you know, that's like when I'm like, if I have a choice of running out to an art project or being of service to, you know, 40 virgins, like that's a no brainer to me. Yeah. Like I've chased art for it's awesome. I love it. But it's the the depth of joy I get from from being able to host and be of service is it's it's that that's yeah. I mean that's where I'm at now with with Burning Man. And and that's something like well if you haven't got that then you yeah, missed the point. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um if you by all means go to Burning Man three years and then don't ever go again. I've I've zero problem with that. Like totally. there's, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Like Halcyon and I accept that we are addicts. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is, this is, this is going to be like, we're going to, you know, go till we physically can't go anymore. Uh, but part of that is because like, you know, maybe there's like this obsession with like always looking a little bit deeper and always looking at this thing. And then next year fine tuning it and doing this thing, saying that you aren't getting any more out of it. Like, I guess like everybody has different ways of wording that and describing it, like different people's words mean different things. Yeah. So, you know, obviously each person's experience is their own, but, um, God, it's, there's 70,000 people. There's so much to explore. There's, there's the depth of the kinds of people you can connect with. There's ways you can push yourself. You can push your comfort zone. You can, you can, I don't know, try the human carcass wash, you know, like maybe and what have you discovered in yourself to give? Yeah. Yeah. After only three years, <laughs> You know, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I know. I know. I mean, I truly like the, the reason why I. I'm sure somebody will knock our socks off with their argument. Like spot on. It's just it just happens to be that you, me, and you are sitting yeah, here on the mic. Well, we're not going to argue with yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, my, my I have I believe that when people authentically express themselves, that is the key. If 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 our doomed world is to be saved, mm. it is going to be when somebody's allows some inner truth to pop out of them. Right. And our culture does not foster that. Our culture has people sit in rows and teaches them to be consumers mm. and teaches them to think according to the cultural rules. And it does it steers them away from whatever magical next level thinking and right. solutions that are inside them. Burning Man is not the only thing, but right. it's the best thing I know that gives people permission and allows these magic solutions to pop out. And so until I stop seeing that happen, I'm going to continue to be yeah. to dedicate a huge part of my life to making sure that that system of permission continues to to let the magic out. You no, know, what you're describing, like that right there, could be absolutely like a very credible um, uh, argument in my mind uh, about less of a, a need or a desire to go back again and again. Um, a lot of the stuff that's been happening in the Burning Man community and other communities that have been influenced or have even some mild overlap with the Burning Man community, they are now finding their way into more and more of the default. So there's, okay. there's more and more avenues than there ever have been to find that magic. And okay, it used to be this, just no. Burning Man. All right. So yeah. if you, when you say I've gotten all I need out of it because now I opened my clinic and I'm giving to the default world in yeah, some way. Yeah. Okay, then I changed my mind. Now, <laughs> yeah, if, you, yeah. if you feel like I've ha I've seen all the partying that I want, yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I don't, it's not fun anymore. That's the one I've heard a lot. That yeah. I'm like, eh, I'm kind of, kind of, yeah, that's that's true. If you're really focused on the party, and like that's 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 where that was the depth of where you got into, which is like again, like that's fine. Um, it's just that you know if you're listening to this show, chances are strong. <laughs> <laughs> you want to keep you, going deeper. You can see deeper. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, uh, a like it was funny. Like I had an interesting experience. I was camped um, with my partner's team this year, Blue Team, and um, it's a lot of 
uh, the majority of that crew works like does a bunch of work for Burning Man. Like they're like medics and gate and cool. Um, uh, is the f- very interesting thing. I think I want to say for a lot of them, I was like their seventeenth year or something. This camp's culture was very much about like they have like their shade front porch area, and they're mostly hanging out right there in the front porch, and um, they go to their work shifts. And they're back hanging out in the front porch. Nice. And a lot of it is like, they don't, a lot of them, like they don't get to see each other all year. And this is like their family reunion. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like watching this and I'm like, you know, my instinct is like, I want to go out. I want to meet people. I want to connect. I want to go, I want to go have a conversation with a college professor from Eastern Europe at three in the morning. You know, like that's my thing. Right. Right. But it was interesting to be camped with a crew that was like, they were cool to like hang out on the front porch and then they were like, we're going to go party at duck pond for a little bit. Then we're going to come back and hang out at our camp. There's that's our family reunion. This is what we do. And so I got to, I got to experience this brand new as an, it's an example yeah. of one of the many faces of burning man that exists that people think they've only seen one side of it, but there's all these different subcultures and communities right there. Right. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, it, sometimes I'll, I, I'll fantasize about, I'm going to do it a different way. But I mean, yeah. I'm just so in love with the way I'm doing it right now. We'll see. I, no. it, but I mean, if I, if I did get bored, I, I would, I would walk 10 direction, 10 feet yeah. in another direction and try that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm looking forward to next year camping with a whole different camp and oh, cool. getting like a whole different experience. So far every year I've been at a different camp. Um, and I've been able to sort of get these like different, um, different experiences of Burning Man. Like last year, for example, being, uh, uh, with, um, we're all, you know, we can actually wrap up here in just a second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see here. Yeah. It looks like we're here reaching out in front of Um, yeah. It's just even being with a different camp this year. Um, or last year I was at Burners Without Borders, you know, so this year being with a much smaller camp and then like next year I might want to give the shot of being with like a bigger theme camp. Who knows? Maybe a pink heart. <laughs> see what you guys are well, up to. Well, we should be in touch. <laughs> we, we've got some pretty strict responsibilities yeah. and guidelines, yeah. but uh, I think I know a guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> do you want, do you want to, hold on. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's okay. We're we're sort of reaching the uh, the end of it. I mean, it, it's just that's one of the one of the many thoughts that I was having is that obviously, like me and you, can sit here and talk about Burning Man for the next five hours. So it probably makes sense to just do this once a year. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, I had this awareness this year that um, I cannot have a conversation of any depth more than two to three minutes without mentioning Burning Man. Yeah. Because I kind of annoy the shit out of me too. Well, uh, you know, well, <laughs> yeah. Because everything, every part of my life has been affected by Burning Man. My yeah. personal growth, my, my spirituality, my sexuality, my professional life, yeah. like almost every job I've had over the last, my, my last like four jobs have been in some way affected by Burning Man. Right. What I'm doing now is affected by Burning Man. What like, so if you want, if you ask me, and you're not just asking what the weather's like, I, I'm gonna mm. talk about Burning Man. Yeah. And it's cool. Like I had, um, you know, where I live, I live with a lot of people who are not burners in, mm. in my neighborhood, but they think it's fascinating. And every once in a while I'll bring up the Hugmobile, the big pink winged motorhome to, to load it up. And so everyone's got questions when I come back in town and, <laughs> and a few people are, are just are beautifully fascinated. And so I love talking to, but some people, give me these, these reactions that are sometimes can kind of throw me. I, I was talking with this one handyman at the, at my condo complex and he's mm-hmm. like, he's like, you guys just give things away, you know? And you're just like, just like let down your walls. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's amazing what happens when everybody is just trusting and vulnerable. And he's like, you know, evolution has not been kind to those who do not keep their guard up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, damn, the dark. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I guess you're right. And I guess, I, I mean, I, and I think that, that, but he did kind of highlight yeah. one of the reasons why people have a hard time getting it. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I've been raised in a way that like you protect your family right, right, right. and you keep your guard up. No, we, we are, we are privileged as Absolutely. fuck to be able to be a part of this community. Cause like, yeah, there are majority of the world is still in a position where, yeah, the guard needs to be up just to literally survive throughout Absolutely. the day. Absolutely. So, uh, one of the things that, that at pink Heart we do a meal eat, and I, I do like a grace before meal every time. And, and, mm. and one of the, the things that I, and at every meeting, actually once a month we have a meeting and every time I return us to that gratitude of right. like in the history of human consciousness, 
the number of people who have had the luxury and the abundance and the resources to be able to dedicate huge chunks of their time to express themselves, right, to, right, right. to open their hearts and create artistically and to explore themselves and their communities and lift people up. I mean, like the luxury of that is yeah. so not just one percent, it's point oh 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 yeah yeah oh, 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 1%. No, it's not. like like it's it's and if we forget that then then and well, actually if you remember that it makes the dust storms like blessings. Yeah, oh yeah no I mean just just the level of privilege it takes to go to an environment that's trying to kill you the second you step out there, yeah. you're like, this is where we will party. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that's that's brilliant. <laughs> uh and, and speaking of privilege actually like uh, you know this is the other topic that I feel like um, it'd be the elephant in the room if we didn't hit was uh, about, you know, the situation with uh, Nixon and um, the police crackdown uh -huh. for everybody driving into the burn this year. You know, it's interesting, by the way, just right now, I, I Googled to see like what new information there is up about it and I haven't really seen much. So I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. The last thing that we saw was um, the, I want to say the chief of the, the tribe um, uh, made a statement that Burning Man was a part of the meetings where they agreed to have this crackdown and Burning Man released a statement saying, nope, we had, we had, we had, we were not a part of this. We don't know why they're targeting our community. Um, and uh, for for listeners should definitely, you know, Google on their own what that situation is, because I don't think either of us are in a position to speak on that yeah. <laughs> officially. Uh, but long story short, um, there was just like a heavy law enforcement crackdown on anybody and everybody driving in. Um, and it was very specific to the community of Nixon, yeah. which is a Native American community. Right. Right. And so and it was and, tribal enforcement, which uh, is federal, right? Right. It's federal law enforcement agency. Um, yeah. And, and it's like the guy that's running that answers to, to Trump is my right. understanding. So it, it, it's, it's easy to start to like try to figure out like, what was the yeah, motivation? Yeah, yeah. You know, was yeah. it, I mean, I heard people say, well, it's because the, because of the drought there, they can't do their car washes. So they're trying to make money in another way. And I'm like, right. I don't, think that's it well you know? one one the, the thing is yeah it's because the thing is it's not um again like it's not my i'm absolutely not an expert in this in fact listeners i'm going to make it a point to try to get somebody on the show who can speak on this very officially that'd be awesome uh so that we can get like the details and i'm certain we can uh in the coming month or two um the i do know that it is a a federal law enforcement agency I do know that it wasn't like necessarily like there, there, there was a lot of different motivations for why the crackdown was happening. And some of them were like at the federal level. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I've read is that this is something that they're doing like across, um, uh, like they're doing it in many, many different uh, communities across the country. It's just like over here, we happen to like get a much closer, clear view of it. And the official answer that they gave is because they're trying to fight the, uh, opium addiction right. in the native american communities which any burner yeah who's I, I at all the burner would laugh at that whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever they whatever they did catch people with i'm pretty sure it was not yeah. about opiates no but i no. mean you, you, i mean but they were looking for any excuse to pull people over if your license plate was like mildly skewed which by the way let me give you a perfect example of what a ridiculous reason that is to pull people over we went to like two different bike shops in san diego and asked if they have a special license plate holder or something that you can put on for bikes on bike racks so that they're not, um, so you can still see them. at night. Yeah. yeah. They were beyond confused. They're like, couldn't you just explain to the, the police officer that you're like, oh, no, 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 no. These are not, yeah. these are not the cops that are like logically listening to what you have to say and go, oh, you know what? You're right. That's okay. Like, no, these guys are looking for an excuse to pull you over. They don't give a shit. Yeah. And they're forcing you to, they're basically, we're telling people like, all right, empty out your car, empty out your, um, uh, you know, your, your trailer, whatever, if you don't do it, we're going to do it. And of course, like if they do it themselves, they're not doing it nicely. They're chucking everything to the side of the road. And then they're leaving people to like fill their, you know, vans and trucks and everything back up on their own. I, I am embarrassed to admit that as I was going through Nixon and I, mm -hmm. I, I came up upon a motorhome pulled over and like five cop cars around them. Yeah. I was like, whew. Not me. <laughs> They're yeah. occupied with someone else. I'm sure everyone who passed by <laughs> yeah. was thinking that. Although, did you hear about the people that uh, were decoys? Like, uh, oh, what's this? Akbar or something? Yeah, Akbar, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about that guy. Yeah, who put a flag up with an ISIS flag. Yeah. He had uh, a 
a harmonica case that looked like a gun case yeah. in his car. He had a cooler filled with dry ice and a fake yeah. rubber hand. Yeah. And he was a veteran. And a veteran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and he's purposely, he's like, I've been sober like 20 years or something. So he just does it just to fuck with police. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like, and told him, he goes, hey, I'm pranking you guys. Yeah, and, yeah, but yeah. by that time, they're like, what the? Yeah. He goes, I think I took up 10 hours of at least six police officers yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's legend. legend. Yeah, yeah. It's, um. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. I mean, we, 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 we went through and we definitely saw like there was, you know, heavy presence, heavy focus. We don't have exact answers and details. Um, we will soon. I, I will try to find somebody to get It's a pretty those scary guys. thing though, because like, yeah. like it really highlights a, a weak link in our freedom. You yeah. Know, like, like we all had to go through this little tiny town mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, the whole system that we thought we understood and right, we, controlled, right. we had systems to work around it, it broke. Yeah. And I mean, it, it so significantly that the be, it, beforehand, there, a lot of people I knew that, that this is not real. This yeah, is like, yeah, this yeah. is the fake insects and locusts. This right. is not, you know, that, but I mean, it sounds like it was legitimate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it was legit. Uh, and it's the reason I thought about bringing it up right now was because we we're just talking about privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the, a couple of things to consider, um, I can tell you on a personal level, the reason that it pisses me the fuck off is it always pisses me off when I see, when we take a shield, when an agency takes a shield and turns it into a sword. Mm. So it is to protect like the laws of like your license plate being shown and you know, your, your lights, your brake lights being on and this kind of stuff. Those are generally for the public safety, but now you have this one agency, this one federal law enforcement agency who has a very specific agenda. They're taking this thing, this law that's supposed to protect society and they're using it as a sword right, to attack a very specific community. Yeah. And that's really fucking disgusting. Um, Beyond that, I mean, I'm sure we'll get more information in the coming couple of months or whatever, but the reason that it really caught my attention and I thought, I think it's going to be an interesting topic of conversation for us as a community to explore in the coming year is that it is also a symptom of our, our privilege that we are experiencing this kind of persecution mm -hmm. and, um, most, I would say a, a, a giant chunk of burners haven't had this particular kind uh, of experience before right. of being targeted by law enforcement and it's jarring and it's terrifying. And the reason it caught my attention is because I was like looking through Facebook, some of the Facebook groups trying to see like what ch chatter there's being had about it. And one of the things that I started to see was certain, um, these are native American, uh, uh, Facebook users, absolutely not representing the tribe or anybody, just like random people commenting. Somebody said something to the effect of, well, now you guys know how it feels. This right. is the shit that's been happening to us forever. Right. And I'm like, that made my jaw drop. I'm like, you're right. This is why it's pissing me off right. because yeah, there's a lot of communities. If you're African American, if you're any other kind of minority in various parts of the world, I mean, a lot of what we see in the United States with like what, a lot of communities have had to endure with certain law enforcement, local law enforcement agencies, which has become like a normal part of their life being persecuted. Right. Now you have a whole lot of privileged burners having that experience. And it's going to be a fascinating thing to explore in the coming year, I think. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting flip of that perspective yeah. of, of rather than the rage of their, it's a war against the freaks. Yeah. A reminder that it's been a war against everybody else yeah, for a yeah, long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. We, we that story exists in our community because we have a lot of like you know non traditional thinkers. But then the other thing that our community does have is a whole lot of white people. Yeah. So like one of the reasons that Burning Man has been allowed to become the size that it has and has had the success that it has uh, has been um, to some extent uh, because we have we have a lot of white people. <laughs> we have a lot of connected people. We have programs like lawyers for burners. We have, uh, uh, powerful politicians who are supportive of burning man. Um, and that puts us definitely in a position of privilege that like, I can tell you, for example, a hip hop festival is not going to have, right. It's a lot harder to do. Yeah. You start blowing things up have been yeah. at, a, at a hip hop festival. Yeah. Oh my God. Over quite as well. Do you imagine that? Yeah. Like setting things on fire. At hip -hop. <laughs> yeah. That's just, yeah, it's, so anyway, I, I think that that's going to be an interesting topic to explore. I, I, 
I would love to get more into it once we get more hard information on yeah. what actually happened with the law enforcement. Yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, even without the information, it's still a bunch of fascinating things to think about. You know, right. but but it would be really interesting to if if to hear some expertise about what yeah. what happened. Yeah, they did, and I think you know again, like sort of like the, the biggest thing about this year, this was our first year without Larry Harvey. Yes. You know, and what a, what a year, like he got to see the Smithsonian. Yeah. Something like that. That's gotta be, man, if anything, I mean, like I'm trying to put myself in like Larry's shoes. I almost feel like that'd be a nice end opus. Like, totally. What a cool, I win. That's the end. (laughs) That's, you know, I, I, I heard a lot of interesting, um, reactions and, and I heard some people feel like that there wasn't enough tributes to Larry this year, mm. you know, and I don't feel that way at all. I mean, yeah. I, I kind of feel like it, it, I, I don't think he would want no. himself to be created into this symbol of it, you know, I think, or that I, I I think that there were cool memorials and people did things and there was things in the temple that I thought were really gorgeous. And, but to, to think that, that Bernie man lost something because right. Larry died, I think would bum him out. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, uh, I think it would be the, I, I think it would be very anti burning man to have had a bunch of tributes to Larry. <laughs> I, I actually thing. had a big thing planned. I had, I, I, I tried to recruit some art cars and I wanted mm. to do this big thing. And, and then, um, uh, and then I, I started to feel like, you know what? I think this is just, this is more for me. Yeah. All right. This, I don't, this is not a good idea. I can dig that. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that the, there was the, the system reset. Yeah. yeah. The, the moment of silence. I think I was on my bicycle and screaming in pain when that was happening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh were you were you were you somewhere when it happened? I was not aware of what time it was when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know there was a moment though. And I mean there's so much shit going. I mean the entire there's there's lots of unintentional tributes to Larry. I mean, you know, they crashed two railroads together. <laughs> two two rail cars together. That's great. Um it was, it was definitely, you know, it was a magical year. I wish I could have enjoyed more of it. I did enjoy Aphrodite on Monday night. <laughs> uh, Sunday night, I had a horrific time trying to sleep um, because Duck Pond, I, I, they may have like connected with an art car or something. Um, they were around the corner from our camp and the sound was so insane that we could feel it like in our toes vibrating. <laughs> I mean, it was just absolutely like an ass kicker. I've never, it felt as if like we're sitting like right in front of the fucking speakers. Wow. <laughs> um, that was an interesting experience. I had a, had a, a night when I was like, Oh no, something's going wrong in my motor home. Something's mm-hmm. like, something's like my, my, my fridge is spewing something. I'm like, Nope, that's just try fucked his base <laughs> <laughs> rattling my car. <laughs> oh man, man. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a, another magical year. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I thought this year was so, uh, like, there, I heard almost across the board that people had amazing years. I mean, yeah. yours is, I think, the worst story ever. <laughs> yeah. So Every, everybody is meant to have their one super shit year, I feel like. And and I think there's something, there there is something to be said for remembering that it's not a given, you know, that, right. that to keep you humble and keep you, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, let me just knock on wood and say, I don't need that. By yeah, the universe. Yeah. I, I, you haven't I, had the one shit year. <laughs> um, out of 18 fucking years, you haven't had like one. I've like, had really hard years, but yeah. the thing is when I look back on them, yeah. they, I treasure them. Yeah. You know, like I, I feel like, you know, what we were talking about earlier, like in the discomfort is when the, the, the big shit happens. Is, Absolutely. And, and, and I, when, I, one of the reasons why I don't pressure people to go to Burning Man anymore, because if you want to have a good burn, you're going to have some rough times right, right, right. and nobody should be pressured into that. You should go in Absolutely. Like, by choice. Um, and, and so it, I've definitely had years that were, that where I cried fewer times than others, but I don't think I've ever not cried. Right. Never right. I've been pushed to my edge. Yeah. Yeah. I cried a lot this one. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. I mean, on the drive over here, I was, rem- I, I remembered I'd forgotten, I guess, but I remembered that, whenever I've had these like difficult periods in my life, they've been 
they've been the preface to a massive growth, massive shift. This is like, you know, it's the, the, the climax of that chapter. Right. Um, but yeah, but no, I, I, you know, we do want to dedicate, I and mean, we've already did a, we did our, our special Larry episode, um, when Larry passed, which you contributed a, a story for, All right. um, you know, it's funny on that episode, I forgot to tell my Larry story, which was, uh, the first time that I went to, um, the org office in San Francisco in the mission district, I had a couple of interviews scheduled there and, um, I, I walk up to the door and you got to like hit the buzzer. Cause you're like on the fourth floor or something. So like you gotta hit the buzzer and they have to like buzz you in and I'm waiting to be let in. And I look behind me and I see like from the distance, uh, Larry walking up to the office. And I remember I looked at him, I'm like, oh, you know what? This is gonna be kind of awkward. I, I, it was like my first year or second year, maybe it was like first year of starting the show, still like total rookie. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know if I feel like, I wouldn't want to be bugged by a random guy in a parking lot right, right now. So right. I'm just going to like let this go. And I'm sure if I'm meant to meet him, I'll meet him, you know, we'll see. And uh, so then they buzz me up and I go up and I don't see him. Mm. And then so like, uh, yeah, when then, uh, then when the news came, we told the story on that episode. Like I was like, man, there's the interview I'll never get. Oh. <laughs> I had, uh, I, I've met him a number of times mm. and usually there was somebody with him that knew who I was yeah. and was trying to like, Hey, this is Halcyon. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like they worked with him and trying to kind of like get him. And, and every time he was, he just saw me as another burner who, yeah. you know, was, eh, yeah. and so I was like, it, it never was that satisfying. Yeah. Whatever pink haired guy. Yeah. <laughs> and until, uh, this, uh, a couple of years ago at, uh, I got to go to the Esalen gathering where they did like a, a Bernie man philosophic symposium with a bunch of staff. And he was there and, and it was way slower pace and not few people. And so I got to sit down with him once and, and got to, and, and in, in that sitting, you know, he knew who I was and it was mm. just like this, like, <sighs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. that feels free. Like, I don't want to put you on a pedestal, old man, yeah. but I got you on a pedestal. Yeah. yeah. But he's, oh. he's, he's, uh, he has, he's, like I, I get weird with calling him like the founder and the creator, you mm -hmm. know, like he, he lit the match yeah, and he kept the vision and he kept the philosophy. And, you know, there's a lot of great videos of him spitting fire about right. philosophy and, and, and ideas. And, um, and I think a lot of, it's not just him, but the founding group, yeah, you know, really put, a huge amount of effort and passion and, and sacrifice into making this thing into something that did not become another festival with sponsorship right. and things like that. They, I mean, they could have cashed out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for that, that is, that is such a rare thing in our culture for people to hold the line so powerfully. And, and he was, you know, the, the, the symbolic and philosophical leader of that. So I, I think that, you know, while I say, don't want to give him too much credit. I also want to give him massive credit right, right. and much love and respect and appreciation, Larry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I there was an interview that I did with uh, Stephen Raspa that we ended up like not releasing, um, uh, due to some technical edit issues and stuff like that. But, um, I do remember like Raspa was saying like, yeah, that, that, uh, you know, a lot of like the cacophony society, uh, in those earlier days were like, all right, the experiment's over. Too many people are showing up. Yeah. It's gotten big. And, uh, he, I remember, I always remember it stuck out in my head when Steven said, um, but you know, credit to Larry, uh, he saw it as scalable. He saw the vision that this thing could be bigger and bigger. And so, um, you know, really like what burning man is can be, uh, it's in no small part, thanks to the amazing work that all of the founders have done. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to all the gifts that you listeners, uh, uh, burners, are bringing to the burn. I mean, they're here. Everyone has contributed to this thing. Um, the thing that Larry had was that he had the, the arrogance <laughs> to say, <laughs> Nope, we can go bigger when yeah. people were saying, no, 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 we should just cut it off here. And like, and that's, that's every group wants that one guy who refuses to get off the dance floor. <sighs> and, 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 and the thing that you like when he gets pushed, when he ever got, he got pushed on things like, well, what about the, you know, 
don't you think it's starting to sell out, you know, or yeah. he was always like, look, radical inclusion, you know, yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is, he, 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 he had the ability to, to, to explain what was going on and mm. also not define what was going on. Right. Right. And that's a, that's a rare kind of, uh, guidance and restraint, I think. Yeah. And, and that's why it works yeah, yeah, yeah. because my burn isn't your burn. Isn't anyone's burn. Exactly. It's Larry's burn. And Larry was fine with that. Yeah. 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 That's tough. And you know, I, I'm sure you get, you know, this experience that I'm about to describe, like, yeah, there's, there's always going to be people in your circles who very well-meaning people, very well-meaning. They keep trying to come in. They're trying to tell you, you should do it this way. And you yeah. should, you should build your thing this way. And you should be build your camp this way. You should do your project this way. You're losing control. It's all going to fall apart if you don't do it this way. You know, and there's a lot of that chit chat, a lot of that chatter in your ears when you're a community builder. And, uh, and I think like, yeah, it takes guts to be like, meh. I'm going to, I'm going to trust. Exactly. I'm going to trust that it's meant to be this way. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the, 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 that was one of the lessons of Pink Art this year. That's one of the lessons of Burning Man is that when you let people, when you give people permission right. to do what they feel is best and to express what they think is true, you cannot predict what will happen, but it will be awesome. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Letting go. All right. Thank you, Halcyon. Oh, it's so yeah. awesome to catch up with you. Heck I love yeah. you so much. Love you. This and is, I yeah. love you, everyone who's listening. <laughs> this is this. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this on uh, leading up to this episode. We we're like, oh, yeah, all right, I guess, I guess this is our new tradition. Just like the last couple of traditions that this show's developed, like they just kind of happened. We we're like, yeah, God, I just really like. I've had a tough burn. I don't feel like having a round table. I just want to sit down with John. <laughs> this has been great. Yeah, it has. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, shout out to Timmy from the Honey Puddle for getting on my ass about getting this episode out. I'm sorry, listeners. It was like 95% complete, but I was traveling and that last, there was this like last bit that needed to get fact checked and stuff before we went live. So that's why it took so long. Uh, you are now listening to the sounds of Black Velveteen. Uh, this set was recorded late evening into sunrise at the Sonic Runway art piece from atop the Air Pusher art car at Burning Man 2018. The Air Pusher art car, in case you're not familiar, is like a steampunk blimp. It looks super badass. Uh, at, at some point during the set, apparently like Rangers boarded the car and asked Chris, <laughs> AKA Black Velveteen, uh, if she needed assistance in securing the ship from taking off, which got a big laugh. Uh, and then uh, apparently the lead over at Sonic Runway legit thought that they were going to like shut down the sound or something so <laughs> giggles uh you can find black velveteen ever at soundcloud.com slash chicago 95 she is part of the air pusher collective which you can learn more about at airpushercollective.com please give us a like on facebook and join the facebook group and uh, leave us a review on iTunes. All these links are over at burnerpodcast.com. You can connect with me on all the social medias at Mr. Arash. That's M R A R A S H. Burner Podcast is produced by Rebel Dharma along with associate producers Lee Hemingway and Tori Massey and network music editor Navjeet Sarna. Uh, new episodes are up at the end of the first and third weeks of the month. We're aiming for Fridays. Uh, used to be Wednesdays, but we're switching to Fridays as of next show after this one being like a week late. Uh, the show is available on all the podcast platforms. Our opening theme music, America's Horse with No Name Remix, is produced by Joman. Check out his music over at soundcloud.com slash DJ Joman. We love you, dear listeners. Until next time, love and light and all that other crap. Take us out, Black Velveteen.
Burnerpodcast.com. <laughs>